All right, Shalom, I'm going to begin this lesson by giving all praise, honor, and glory to Yahweh, Ba'ashim, Yahweh, Shah, Waha, Rakab, Kudash, which in the ancient Hebrew tongue would be the correct names of the Heavenly Father, His beloved Son, and the Holy Spirit. Also, I'd like to give double honors to my teachers, the head apostles and elders of Great Millstone. Much due honors and respect to the sense of brethren out there that's also laboring in his work. And as always, I want to say shalom to the believers. You know, the Akim as well as the Akwath, which will be your brothers along with the sisters that subscribe to this truth as well. So, yeah, just wanted to go into another quick lesson, which this sitting right here, in a very overtone of it, if you will, will be concerning the kingdom and pretty much taking a more in-depth look into the veracity of it, meaning the truth concerning the kingdom of heaven which that phrase, the kingdom of heaven, <laughs> is one that has been widely misinterpreted and completely taken out of its proper context. And that's mainly due to these different circles who claim to build their foundation off the Holy Scriptures, with Christianity pretty much being at the forefront, which we all have been under that vibration. At one point in time or another, we was all influenced by that hell of a drug known as Christianity which pretty much conditions your mind to believe that the idea of heaven is only experienced after death. You know what I mean? And when you die and your spirit is found in good graces with the one you know is God, well, in that event, then your spirit will ascend upward, you know, versus those who are not found in good graces with the Most High, where their spirit will descend to the underworld. You know, they'll be banished to the abyss, Right? Well, guess what? What we found out is that the kingdom of heaven is nothing more than the next regime that will come into power at the removal of this current beast system, which is now being governed over by the so-called white man. See, what you're witnessing is a transition of power, and that's the very essence of the ministry of our Lord Yahweh Shah, which is phrased as the kingdom of heaven. You know, that was the emphasis, you know, put on that ministry. The kingdom of heaven is at hand, you know, which these biblical timelines is dedicated to the rise and fall of kingdoms. And pretty much in a nutshell, the good news being that the Lord will once more show favor unto his people. And that favor or that peace, if you will, will be manifested in the form of the Lord raising up a people that has been beaten down, downtrodden, robbed, spoiled, raped, pillaged, and murdered, you know? And, and, and abasing the very ones who afflicted us. That's the idea of the kingdom of heaven. Pretty much a role reversal. Matter of fact, let's start off right there before we get into this lesson. It's the book of Luke, the 16th chapter, and the 25th verse. It says, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. Yeah, and to set the stage here, what we read in this the parable concerning Lazarus and the rich man, which for those of you out there who have eyes to see, you know that this parable captures the very essence of this transition of powers that we're witnessing. The rich man being symbolic to Esau, the so-called white man, and Lazarus symbolizing you so-called Negroes, Latinos, and Native Americans. And when you read in this parable, it pretty much details the fact that Lazarus would be at the bottom. It tells you how Lazarus was laid at the gate of the so-called white man, the rich man, full of sores, which those sores represented the effects of slavery. Okay? So this parable outlines the fact that the rich man, again being symbolic to Esau, is on top, and Lazarus would be at the bottom. But when you read on in this parable, the tables turn, and this is where we're going to pick it up at. Again, this is the book of Luke, the 16th chapter, and again, the 25th verse, it says, But Abraham said, Son, which is concerning Esau, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. Yeah, meaning in this current lifetime, Esau received the fatness of the earth. You know, this man pretty much seized control of the entire planet Earth. You know, the resources of the planet Earth. He cornered the market concerning gold and oil and diamonds or whatever resources out there. See? 
This is what the scripture mean when it says, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. But it goes on to say, and likewise, Lazarus, evil things. Yeah, and indeed we received evil here in this lifetime from being brought over here as cargo to serve hardcore bondage. It's well documented the lynchings and burnings and castrations and so on and so forth, even to this very day. Esau has made a conscious effort. This man has strategically, you know, signed certain legislations into law that's, you know, in attempt to keep us in further derision, to keep us further oppressed. See? So this is what the scripture means when it says, we received evil things. Let's read it again. It says, but Abraham said, son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. And again, this is concerning Esau. You know, here in his season, if you will, his time to rule, he received good things. See? But it goes on to say, and likewise, Lazarus, which again is symbolic to Israel, evil things. See? It says, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. See? So in the world to come, we will be comforted and Esau will be tormented. Pretty much meaning our power will be solidified, if you will, by Esau being at the bottom. And that's the case now. The so-called white man being on top pretty much testifies to us being at the bottom, which all goes back to that struggle in the womb between Jacob and Esau. But guess what? In the world to come, we're going to subdue our enemies, man. We're going to be comforted, and Esau going to be tormented, see? Which is going to contribute to that rigorous rule that's going to be in the kingdom of heaven, man. We're going to rule over you devils with a rod of iron as well as the other nations, Okay, now when you consider the kingdom of heaven, we don't know every detail concerning the world to come. As it is written, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard the things in which the Lord has prepared for those who love him. So here in these mortal bodies, we can't retain that type of information. That's why we're going to actually have to have new bodies to even experience the kingdom of heaven in its perfection. But when you read the scriptures with understanding, it gives you an idea of how the kingdom will be governed. And how do we know that? Well, by looking into the reign of King Solomon, which was pretty much a prelude to the world to come, <laughs> where Israel dwelt at peace and in safety under King Solomon. You know, that time will be resurrected, if you will, by Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shah which in itself is a powerful work. You know, it's heavy when you consider, you know, certain people, they look back in retrospect, they might reminisce on the good old days, the glory days, the golden years, and what they would give to relive that time. Well, guess what? The Lord is going to actually allow us that access. He's going to resurrect that time. And it's going to play out in the form of the kingdom of heaven. Now, when you go right here to the book of Isaiah, the 60th chapter, and for those of you who have eyes to see, you understand that this chapter, it gives you a glimpse, if you will, into the world to come, into the kingdom of heaven. Well, you're going to see where that parallels the time of Solomon. All right. So let's start off right here in the book of Isaiah. The 60th chapter. And starting at the 10th verse, it says, And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls. Yeah, and again, this is concerning the world to come. We're not going to build up the kingdom of heaven. No, the other nations is going to build, starting with the so-called white man. Just like America, you know, Egypt, all these different captivities we was forced to serve, just like they was built, you know, at the expense of the blood, sweat, and tears of the children of Israel. But that's going to apply to the other nations in the kingdom. You're going to build up the kingdom, see? And this is what we read here again. It says, and the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their king shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. So the Lord said the sons of strangers are going to build up our walls. They're going to build up the kingdom. And these kings of the planet earth are going to be our ministers, meaning they're going to serve us. The very rulers that you see throughout the planet earth and throughout time, these different regimes, these empires and kingdoms, that came to power from damn Ramses II who put hell on us in ancient Egypt. Well, guess what? The Lord is going to resurrect that spirit and he's going to serve us in the kingdom of heaven. Let's read this again. It says, And the sons of strangers 
shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Now, what we just read here again is a glimpse into the kingdom of heaven. All right? Well, guess what? This actually parallels the time of Solomon. Let's go there. This is the book of 1 Kings, the 10th chapter. And starting at the 23rd verse, it says, So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. Yeah, and that word exceed pretty much translates to excelling, you know? So King Solomon was the king of kings, see? Verse 24, it says, And all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which the Most High had put in his heart. And guess what? That's going to happen in the kingdom of heaven. The other nations is going to flock to Israel to hear the law of Yahweh Bashem and Hawasha, as it is written in the book of Isaiah, the second chapter, out of Zion shall go forth the law. See? Verse 25, and it's the point. It says, and they brought, meaning these kings, and they brought every man his present, vessels of silver and vessels of gold and garments and armor and spices, horses and mules, a rate year by year. So yearly, the kings of the earth, they brought presents to King Solomon. Now to get a better understanding on what's going on here, let's click on this word present. All right, again, the scriptures say yearly, these kings of the earth brought presents to King Solomon. Yeah, and the Hebrew word here for this word present would be makah. And it says gift, tribute, tribute. So when the scriptures say the kings of the earth year by year brought presents to King Solomon, they actually paid tribute, which when you go into that word tribute, it translates to taxes, man. See? So the kings of the earth pretty much acknowledged the powers that be, which came in the form of King Solomon in that regime. Well, guess what? That's going to happen in the world to come as well. Which brings us back here to Isaiah the 60th chapter. And again, starting at the 10th verse, it says, And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. See that? For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Therefore thy gates <laughs> shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night. Yeah, meaning the Gentiles is going to pay tribute. See? Of their crops. You know, they're going to pay a certain portion of whatever resources they have. See? Again, therefore thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles and that their kings, see, and that their kings may be brought. See that? And we read that in 1 Kings, the 10th chapter, man, where the kings of the earth, you know, pretty much brought presents yearly to King Solomon. Basically, they was paying tribute. See? Verse 12, it says, For the nation and kingdom that would not serve thee shall perish. Yeah, those nations shall be utterly wasted. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, and the box tree together. Okay? The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, and the box tree together. And this is symbolic to the other nations. When you read the scriptures, you know, from a symbolic point of view, Trees represent the people, the other nations. So all the nations are going to come and pay tribute to us. See, it says to beautify the place of my sanctuary and I will make the place of my feet glorious. Yeah, what does the scripture mean when the Lord says he's going to make the place of his feet glorious? That means the planet Earth. Right now, the Earth is in the worst case scenario. But in the kingdom, the nations is going to build up the kingdom of heaven. And in the process that's going to beautify the place of the Lord's feet. The scriptures tell you how heaven is the Lord's throne and the earth is his footstool. So the earth is going to be upgraded altogether. See, again, it says, to beautify the place of my sanctuary and I will make the place of my feet glorious. See, 
So the planet Earth is going to blossom and bloom into its, you know, perfection as well in the world to come. See, verse 14, it says the sons also of them that afflicted thee. Yeah, and this is concerning all the nations, but most notable Esau, the so-called white man. See, this man is responsible for afflicting us. Again, it says, the sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. Whereas, see, whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency and a joy of many generations see meaning the kingdom of heaven is going to be a perpetual one all right and again this actually parallels the time of king solomon now, how do we know that well let's go back to the book of first kings now in the fourth chapter In the 25th verse, it says, And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine. All right? And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine, and under his fig tree from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. See? All the days of Solomon. So Solomon, which his reign symbolized peace for the nation of Israel, guess what? that's going to come back in its perfection in the world to come. All of Judah and Israel, we're going to dwell safely, every man under his vine. See? We're going to have, you know, our own land, you know, our own crops, our own gold, whatever resources we desire. But the point is, it says, all the days of Solomon. See, as long as Solomon is, you know, exalted and set up, as ruler then israel would be at peace so the kingdom of heaven would be established under king solomon which is our lord yahweh shah for those of you who have eyes to see those of you who have understanding all right now from there this is the book of first kings the second chapter in the 12th verse, it says, Then set Solomon upon the throne of David his father, and his kingdom was established greatly. Now, real quick, when you click on this word, greatly, it says exceedingly much might, force, abundance. But it's heaven when you stroll down here to the Strong's definitions for this word. It says often with other words as an intensive or superlative, which that word superlative pretty much means the highest degree. It says, especially, especially when repeated, especially when repeated. See that? So the world of calm is nothing more than a repeat, if you will, of the glory years of the children of Israel when we dwelt safely and in peace all the days of Solomon, <laughs> which is nothing more than a prelude of the glorious kingdom of our Lord, Yahweh Shah. So y'all just wanted to touch on that. Lord willing, it was edifying. Till the next time I say, Shalom.